having me here tonight. So first off, I'm going to explain the buckwheat thing to you. Uh, buckwheat, uh, it's tradition for the people who discover things on their land to give them naming rights. So the gentleman who found this, working with the bulldozer, I went up to him and I said, you get to call it, what name do you want for this mammoth? And he said, I'm going to call it Buckwheat. And we all laughed about that, thought that was funny, but it actually got registered as the Buckwheat Mammoth site. So that's its official name. Um, so I'm going to run through a chronological sequence of what happened and how we found this mammoth, what we did this summer working at the mammoth site, what we were able to obtain, and then where we stand now with the bones that we have gathered at this particular place. Uh, it all started in April this year. The, uh, there was a, a family building a home in Parker County, the in-laws and outlaws. So the mom and dad had a house they were building, and their daughter and son-in-law were in the other house. Well, the son-in-law is a gardener, he's a landscaper, and he was grading the field and nicked one of the tusks. And you can see it sticking out right here. This is all that was exposed. Well, he, you know, had enough to know that it wasn't a cow bone, and it wasn't, you know, a piece of limestone. So he left it. It rained really hard that night, and all of this was exposed the next morning because he had softened the dirt. So what he did, after accidentally discovering this, was call Oklahoma. Now why you would call Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> We're right here. I have no idea. But they called University of Oklahoma, invited them to come down and look at the tusks to verify whether or not that's in fact what they were. And they said, yep, that's a mammoth. You found any arrowheads? Nope. Well, we are not interested in it. <laughs> so, there it sat, and uh, the son-in-law was friends with the maintenance man on campus. So that's where it ties in. The maintenance man on campus brought a bag of bones to the geology department and showed my colleague, uh, Mr. Will Sigler. And was, he was taken aback by it, and he went out and got permission from the landowner to go out there and visit it. So he did. Now this is a little bit into the future. This one's not exposed yet. So you have to imagine it's still just like one and a fourth tusk out on the ground. And he said, wow, i got to show Lori that. So he came back and he texted me, and we went out for a couple of days later, and that's when this picture was taken, when I went out and saw that. And we were jumping up and down with joy. We said, yes, we'd love to have this project. This is very exciting. That's all we knew at that time. So if I could really give a title to this talk, it would be how a regular person can go outside and get a mammoth and be successful. Because I had no previous experience in this whatsoever. I worked on archaeology sites as part of the crew, but I was never the principal investigator and in charge of something like this, much less dug up a body of a full-grown man. So I had a lot of work to do. I'll give you a little bit of background on the geology of Parker County. Uh, mammoths are Pleistocene in age, the epic, which is roughly 10,500 to 2 million years, that span of time. And so the river deposits that the mammoth was buried in rest directly on, you're probably familiar with the Cretaceous Paluxy sandstone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's oysters and all of that kind of material all intermixed in all of those river gravels. In addition to that, as far as how it's drained there, the Clear Fork of the Trinity River is where this particular creek runs into. 
And we think it's about the first or second terrace from the um, current riverbed. So that's pretty much the geologic location of it. So we had a plan, let's get the tusks. And it was really important for me and my reputation <laughs> to get it right. And because I didn't want to be known as that's the lady that wrecked the mammoth. Because <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. So we knew we wanted to get it out, but we really had to work slowly and talk to experts in the field to help us. So we wanted to come up with some goals. Well, our initial goal was, let's get the tusks and take them back. We already knew that the landowners were going to donate them to Weatherford College, which they, in fact, did. We um, wanted permission to excavate, and we got that. We knew that we were on a timeline because houses were going up. They're building homes. So we thought by the end of the summer, we should pretty much have everything out. They were bigger than any of us, so they're heavy, so there was a whole logistics of getting a crew, getting, you know, trucks, you know, carrying them off the property. It was technically called a salvage operation. It was never going to be a park. It was never going to be public access. It was only going to be, we're rescuing bugs that we see so these people can build their homes. And that would be the end of the particular project. So, what we did, to start off is, I happen to have a geology course that started in May. And so, because we couldn't go to Big Bend and camp because it was on fire <laughs> at that time, I scrambled and made some different plans in that I had my class come out and start excavating the tusks. I had been working on a cabin in Millsap for over a year now, so I knew the right tools and the college already had the right tools, trowels, buckets, brooms, and dustpans, screens. So I already had equipment. I didn't have to worry about getting that. We worked for three days, and then we went on the, did the rest of our field work. We ended up going to Big Bend, but just for a day outing. <laughs> and uh, so at this time, remember, we still just have tusks. And we're real happy to report that in those three days, we were able to completely uncover all the tusks. So the crew worked really fast in getting those exposed. Then we covered them up with the tarp and left it. We didn't really have a schedule yet or a crew yet. And my class was finished in 10 days and they went on their way. So June went by, I had to do some stuff. I had to go to Philadelphia for a wedding. You know, I had to go to archaeology field school. I wasn't around, and the site pretty much just let, laid abandoned for the entire month of June. So when I got done with all that in July, I knew it was time to get back to work. So the first thing was to make it all legit, and I, we signed the contract between the landowners. We used the attorney of Weatherford College and signed the contract between the landowners and ourselves, just simply saying, I won't sue you if I trip on something, and you don't sue us if we accidentally cut an electric cable. And uh, we got that signed and approved, approved, and then we resumed the digging. And we had experts that we were going to bring in, and so we were starting to make those arrangements. We continued to work on getting the tusks out, at the meantime simultaneously doing some research on what exactly it was we were finding. Um, in the meantime, we're back up one. Uh, up here at the top where the red arrows are, we found, started to find more things. We found a tooth and what is either a cheekbone or a mandible, and I'll show you a skeletal picture of that in a minute. And then another little tooth was coming out right here. So we knew we had more than tusks. So this is just showing the work on the on the tooth, and it was the first real legitimate taking your trowel and feeling the difference between the dirt and the bone and knowing that something was in there and getting really excited about that. Um, this was the first tooth that we found on top. The tooth is really messed up, and it's over here, and then it's connected to what 
I'm thinking is the cheekbone. I found something on Google that's very similar in its orientation. This is his face is down, so this would be his top molars, and then there's that same bone. So that is like only one of many bones that we have now. I'll tell you that story in a minute um, that we could identify. And this is just showing you know where that location would be on the skull, either this part or this part. So now we have the experts. So let me introduce you to our first expert. This is Don Esker, and he's in the Department of Paleontology at Baylor. And he was the former director of the Waco Mammoth Site before it became federal. He was also director of a museum in Montana on woolly mammoths. And uh, the director of the, the current director of Waco Mammoth also arrived. But being that she's federal, she was very keen on being identified, so I didn't put her name up here. Um, what these, this group was able to do for us was uh, enormous. We now had a species, a gender, a size, an age. We had approximate dates. We had why it, the bones look so rough. It's called a Behrens-Meyer scale. I'll explain that in a minute. And we were trained on the proper jacketing of the bones and tusks into a plaster burrito, basically, or a pinata, so that we could safely escort them off of the site. So, for the most part, the remainder of July, well, wait, we back up. So, based on what he told us, so I'm backing up here. Let me explain what we have here. We know who this guy is now, for sure. He's a Colombian mammoth, M. Columbi, adult, full-grown male bull Colombian mammoth, approximately 30 years of age, based on the circumference of his tusks. Uh, 20,000 pounds, or about the weight of three suburbans, 12 feet at the shoulder. He was a big boy. And we approximated it was probably late Pleistocene, but we still had a pretty large range of age, 10 and a half to one million years of age. The other thing we knew, let me back up to the second question. Uh, the bones, as you'll see, look really rough. They look like petrified wood. There's some right here. I'll pass some of these around while I'm talking. Mammoth bone, right here. And it's pretty delicate, so don't toss it to your neighbor. But. Um, it just wants to fall apart. Uh, the Behrensmeyer scale is a scale that they use on African elephants, and it's a measure from one to five, just like you rate hurricanes. You know, weak hurricanes versus strong hurricanes. And it says that the higher the number, the more that this guy laid on the ground rotting before he was buried. And that explained the rough condition of the bones. So he was an exposed carcass for up to two years before he was buried, based on this application of this scale. So we start the jacket, and that is, I have a little video here, so I'm going to break away and show you if you don't mind. They're only like 30 seconds. showing actually we found a skull and I'll tell that story in a minute but uh, putting pla uh, plastic and then paper towels and the only reason we put paper towels on the plastic is so the plastic doesn't blow off so it's wet paper towels now this is the separator between the plaster and the bows so the plaster will pop right off and um, 
Then we soak burlap in plaster of Paris. Okay. Layer after layer after layer. And one of the other things that we have to do, is so I'll go, uh, where's me? <laughs> is the burlap uh, a regular, uh, what we call feed sack? Burlap? Feed sack kind of is a, has a course. small grain, mm -hmm. and those are actually better than the kind that you find in a craft store. Yeah, because they're, they uh, soak it up and then uh, Yes, exactly. How long uh, must you let it dry before you start handling it? Um, <coughs> a day or Oh, no. An hour. Oh, is that clear? Yes, and it was July. Oh, yeah. And August, July. and it was 100 <laughs> degrees. Oh, man. So we didn't have any problems. As soon as we left it, we could dry one to two hours, and it would depend on how many layers of burlap you put on. The bigger the bone, the more burlap layers you want because you want it to have strength when you hoist it up. Right. So this is Don Esther and he's showing us. So the first layer of plaster we placed on, and this is one of the tusks. So we have to put two by fours, incorporate them into the burrito to give it strength when you carry it off. So you have to dig tunnels underneath these tusks and then you feed the soaked burlap underneath and incorporate the boards in with the burlap. This is me practically upside down trying to get a tunnel under the skull. It wasn't easy because it wasn't narrow like this. It was a big round pumpkin thing and so we had a time trying to get underneath that. So the next stage is after you get it to this um, stage, you have to flip it because you can't carry it still. The whole bottom is exposed. Everything will just fall out. So we have to uh, hammer crowbars and shovels and anything that we had around. One, two, three, flip. And it's a team effort. And you turn it upside down like we did here. And then you plaster that. After that, it's ready to go. So we did that for several of the bones. You'll see the bones in a minute. Um, by this time, word was getting out, and so not only did we have that article in the paper, we were interviewed by Channel 11. The Channel 11 news story went international, and it was on CNN. So the mammoth in Weatherford was featured in Hawaii, Alaska, New York, Florida, everywhere. Uh, this uh, end of this month, uh, Fox 4's Lone Star Adventure Series is going to do a segment, so watch for that. I don't know when he's going to air it. And just people started coming out of the woodwork, and I'm going to show you a picture of that. And this was a good thing. We wanted them there, because now we have a crew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every walk of life, anyone ever called me, I never turned them away. I said, yeah, come on. It was hot, it was dirty, yeah. it was hard work. And people came with enthusiasm and helped us with this. This is a close-up of some of the bones. I hadn't told you about the bones yet. But these are, see he's knocking on it. You can tell the difference in the sound. And we have people from Master Naturalists. UTA, A&M, UT Austin, Baylor. We have people from Weatherford College. We have friends of people from Weatherford College. So we had a really good crew to help us. Uh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I noticed there was a uh, construction of a house um, beside the place where you had started your day. Yes. So, how did that work out with the builders and people working on the house? And here over here, it's like, don't touch my dig. You know, so we put police tape around yeah. it. Yeah. And yellow tape looks familiar to everybody. Yeah. And we covered it with tarps and weighed it down. We were only out there on Fridays and Saturdays. Oh, okay. The, the construction crew was there every day except Sunday. We were out there some Sundays. Okay. They were doing their thing, and we were doing our thing. Okay. And they pretty much left us alone. And every now and then, one would wander by, look in the hole. We 
you have to explain it's a mammoth bone. And we had some uh, Hispanic helpers who could interpret that that's what that was, and their eyes would just get really big. And, and then we would tell them, you know, well, the, uh, uh, would you describe the sediment that, that he was in? Uh, Soft mudstone, mm -hmm. kind of mud. It varied. Clay, uh, clay. It varied. It, he had a very soft, beautiful, pure sand. Mm -hmm. The deeper you went, okay. we had a silty sand, like a clay loam. Mm -hmm. We yeah. had caliche, oh, okay. and we had cemented gravel with caliche because we were in a gravel mm -hmm. farm. Yeah, where the animal was actually yeah, buried. Carbonate, uh, yes. It up, yes. So yeah. we're yeah. chiseling. We're chiseling and hacking in some areas, but in some areas it's really soft. Yeah. So this was actually the land under our field trip. And so I had to stop and make an interpretation of what we were doing to the friends of the people who were moving in. And they're very, very proud of this project. So we're digging up more and more bones. And... Um, the way we are coming across the bones is somebody would find a bone one foot over, there's another bone. Another foot over this way, there's another bone. And another, and another, and another. We had a whole animal, or at least half of an animal there. And it's been approximated that we had maybe 35 to 45 percent of this mammal. We interpret that he was laying on his left side, his tusks, tusks were downhill, and his body was uphill. And the strange thing about this mammoth is that it wasn't a mammoth. It was a pile of bones here and a pile of bones here, and more on that in a minute. But it didn't make any sense the way the bones were written. This is just some more, uh, this is you, Murray. Uh, more digging at the Mammoth. We worked all in July, and we worked into August. We had some things happen. I'll read this to you in a minute. This is a bone that got broke because I stepped on it. Um, this is showing you how delicate the bone is. And you really, you want to, clean and pick all the way up to the bone and you really have to resist and hold back because the more dirt you leave on it, the more protected it is so that you can work on it in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. But what happened was the wind picked up, the canopy blew and knocked me down. Oh, okay. So it tumbled and hit me in the back and I was all scratched up. So I carefully bagged this bone and I wrote on the bag, August 5th, roadkill. <laughs> We call this the roadkill section because it looked like an animal that had been run over by a car. The bone arrangement didn't make any sense. And so it says, the day that Canby tried to kill Lori, but took out the west bone in the roadkill instead. So. <laughs> so this last video shows you our final, um, the final, we were done. About how deep did you, uh, depth did you? Approximately uh, maybe a meter mm -hmm. in some areas, up to just like 20 centimeters. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it was very shallow. He's very shallow <laughs> and he's not permineralized. So this is looking from, the tusks were over here, they've since been taken out, that was the skull. And I'm just walking across the distribution of the bones and how they look. Mm. And it makes no sense. Did they, did they tend to have... That's the roadkill up there. Did they, did they tend to have giant molars in the bottom? And yes. Only, uh -huh. only down here? Or? Four. They have four okay. molars, okay. two in the bottom, two in the top. Mm. And it took approximately 15 years to really get their, their teeth really set okay. in their mouth. And did you find all four? Uh, we found one for sure, two maybe. Okay. We did uh, not find all four of them. It was told, we were told that possibly when the land belonged to the previous owners, 
that someone had found a mammoth tooth. But we never could track that down and see if that in fact happened. Well, do you think uh, other animals eating the carcass could have right. distributed? Absolutely. If this guy was killed naturally and laid on the ground for as long as he did, he was definitely scavenged. We don't find any tiny bones. Like, we don't even find any vertebrae. Because anything that was little could be picked up and carried away. Or widowed downstream by a current of a river. So only the big heavy stuff is really there. Was it in a riverbed that he uh, died? Or what was the, the, the territory yeah. around him that he died? When he died, we think it was he was washed downstream and settled into a gravel bar. Perhaps so during a flood might, of that particular river. We see might. indication of imbrication and cross bedding in some of the profiles that we looked at. So we definitely were pretty strong about it being a river deposit. Did you wonder if it was? No, it was the Trinity. So northeast Parker County would be the drainage basin into the Trinity. Did you wonder if there was any of it under the construction that's up? I'm oh, saying say again. Did you wonder if there were any parks that were already under the construction? Oh yes, definitely. And we, we had already settled in our mind way at the beginning of the project that we weren't going to venture out. We wanted just to get what we could find and get out of there because we were on a deadline. Our last day was actually August 26th and we were completely out of there. We saw bone everywhere. It was scattered all over the surface. The landowner told us if he found anything significant, he would call us back. And so I believe that they will do that. Right where he is is probably where part of the pool's going, swimming pool. So there's going to be more excavation in this area when we get to that part. When we were finding the bone in the last video you saw, we were running against the end of our project date, and we were, I don't want to admit this, but we were almost saying, oh no, we found another bone. <laughs> because we were trying to get things wrapped up, but in the back of our mind, we were really glad about it. So we're out of there now, and now we're back at the laboratory at Weatherford College. So we needed another expert, because we can wrap that stuff in plaster all day long and carry it off in a truck, pick em up truck, and set it on a table in a lab, but now what? So Tommy Diamond, he works at the Perot Museum. Is he, is he work there, or is he yeah, volunteer? He works there. He works there. And he works in the laboratory there, and he, give me a brief, just real quick, what he does there. Uh, a little better than that. Well, everything, but he's yeah. mainly in the lab, right? He's a Okay. So he came and showed us how to cut this plaster off and showed us what kind of solvents we needed to give strength to the bone because it wants to fall apart. We used something called B72, which is little clear plastic pellets that you dissolve in acetone, fingernail polish. And you can make it thin or you can make it thick. And you initially, and some of these in here will have an example of that. It gives it strength. It soaks into the pores and gives it strength. It's almost like a false permineralization of the bones because these bones were not permineralized. So this is one of the first bones that I actually cleaned and I brought it here today and I'll, I'll show you that. And this is actually roadkill again. We decided to work on roadkill first because we thought that would be good for practice. Because we weren't really sure. We knew it was a big bone. We knew it was a big leg bone of some kind. But we weren't sure what part it was. Because it was far away, you know, a distance from all the other bones. So that was our practice. And what we do is I've set a, I've set a schedule of work days, Fridays and Saturdays, for the rest of the semester. And I'll be sure to send you a copy of those days so that you <laughs> never want to like come and work yeah. or even yes. work with us. Yes, we can. Um, sure. I, I think some of us might. I'd like to come over. It's, it, picking at the bone and cleaning the dirt away is so therapeutic. I just, you have to really like the details in that kind of work, like needlepoint or anything like that. I really enjoy that. So, 
This is something I got off of Google. We have the, we talked about the Oklahoma guys coming and poo-pooing the idea that there was any paleo Indian influence. And so we weren't really looking for any paleo Indian influence. We were watching for shirt and flakes in the screens, and we found some on the surface, but they could have come from anywhere. So one day, we found this. So now we have a paleo Indian site. It's 22 centimeters deep, and it was, I'll show this picture. Here it is. This is a fake pipe cleaner arrow, Murray, because I didn't have a real one there. And it was on the same level as the bone, about 50 centimeters away. Wow. So it's right there to the left. It's right here. Oh, that, that's here. So, so <laughs> is it wholesome or? No, it doesn't look like anything. It's paleo. It's, paleo. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely paleo. And here's why the archaeologists are excited. It doesn't look like a Clovis point. And there's some work going on in central Texas at the vault site where they have pre-Clovis, and the points look a lot like this. Where is that at? The vault site is, I'll have to show you a map of where it is. It's in Central Texas. And you can Google Gault, G-A-U-L-T. What county would that be? I don't know. I can't remember. I've only been there once. But Dr. Collins contacted me and said, hey, I, I really like your point. Um, it's really interesting. I'm really intrigued by that. It kind of matches some stuff I'm doing that are earlier than Clovis. And this is a big argument out there. People who say, no, Clovis was first, and people who are saying, no, 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 they're not. There's people who are a lot older. In the Gulf, they have evidence based on ages of mammoth bone and stuff of 15, 16,000. Clovis is 10 and a half. So that could rewrite textbooks, definitely. This is the girl who found it. She said, can I keep it? Oh. <laughs> how, long, how long was it again? How long is it? How long is it? It's um, about two inches long. It's really small. Yeah. So the other thing is, while we were digging, I had the archaeology crew out there anyway, just in case. So they mapped it, and they got the GPS latitude and longitude, and all of that stuff, just in case we needed it, in case we found something. And when we did, we went ahead and officially registered it with the TARL. T-A-R-L is Texas Archaeological Records Lab. Yes, sir. Did you call Oklahoma? I did not. That's a good idea. I need to do that. We have a big here in their seat. Yeah. I know. Especially if it changes history in textbooks and stuff like that. So why did we say? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, call it later. Yeah. 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 We just said Texas was the one who paid attention. That was the one that paid attention. That's right. That's right. He was just trying to get the meat off the bone, and he had. He wanted to go swimming. He didn't care. Yeah. So um, it has an official trinomial. It's registered with the state of Texas. It's the 183rd archaeological site in Parker County. Wow. So that's official. Yeah, now you know how many archaeology sites there are. So, other than the point that we had, other compelling evidence is this possible butcher mark. So it doesn't run with the grain, it runs perpendicular to the grain. Uh, it's old, it's not a fresh cut. Um, and there's other evidence that goes with the possibility that it could be a butcher mark. Is it cutting across a uh, leg bone or something? One of the long bones, yes, it is. And uh, it's got crystal growth in here, and it's V-shaped instead of U-shaped. If it was U-shaped, to profile would be an animal tooth. Right. So there's all kinds of things you look at. In addition to that, um, wow. it's only the first bone that we cleaned. This is only the first bone that we cleaned. Here it is right here. This is it right here. So. This is that bone, and it's really strong now because it's soaked in the B72, but here's that butcher mark, so I'll pass that around right that there. If, it, if, in fact, that's what it is. That sounds like a kill. Yes, exactly. <coughs> kill 
So if this was butchered, and this is actually a mark from a tool, that might help explain the orientation of the bones. Remember I said this wasn't a mammoth laying on the ground, this is a stack of bones, a stack of bones, because they were cutting and stacking. So that's a possibility as well. Yes. All the bone that we have, and we have over 15 plaster jackets of bone. All of the undersides of the bone are pristine. We've not gotten to it yet. So there's still a lot of, lot of time and a lot of bone to see if, in fact, there are more butcher marks. So it's just a wait and see kind of thing. So this is the last slide, and I just wanted to show where we started. And they're sitting way up high, and here's one and one fourth tusks. And by the time we finished, we made a pretty good pit in this guy's field. Mm -hmm. And I felt guilty about it, and I tried to fill dirt back into part of it and say, don't worry about it, I've got a grader. But if you can see back here, these piles of dirt that went through the screen, we easily did two to 500 buckets of dirt during July and August. So we did move a lot of dirt. Dug him a good foundation for his house. Right. And that's it. along the way, um, Waco and Boehner and uh, Parker County Archaeological Societies and uh, the clubs that help. So anyway, it's been a lot of fun. Keep in contact with me and if uh, you're interested in working on one of the men's pro phone work days, I'll train you. I know how to do <laughs> that.